Blessings and welcome back everyone. I'm astrologer Elsa Wadsworth and I'm here today with astrologer Matt Nolan from the Astrologers Encyclopedia. Welcome back, Matt. Hello. And astrologer Christopher Scott. Hey, Chris. Welcome back again. Um, for those of you, uh, you know, you probably know Matt from Matt's channel and their work with us um, here on this channel, but you might not be as familiar with Christopher Scott. Christopher Scott is a part of our Firmicus Maternus reading group, which is what we're here to um, talk about today. And we are planning to give you guys just a little bio and introduction um, to Christopher Scott so you guys can watch for that. But before we dive into our book club and our maternus juiciness, I just wanted to thank everyone and do like a little celebration that we got to a thousand subscribers. Yay! Thank you everyone so much. It's a big milestone and you know, I know that most people are like, oh, if you don't hit a thousand in like a year, it's been like a couple of years we've been on here. It's like a small like channel and it is a small channel, but we have like a really niche type of study here. And to me, thinking of a thousand people in a room talking astrology is really awesome. It's a lot of people and I appreciate everyone tuning in and um, interacting as much as you all do. So in you know the spirit of that, I think we're going to do our first live so that we can interact with you guys more often. I'd like to do more casual sort of live, maybe Q&As, chart examples, um, Christopher, Matt, and a few special guests as well that I think you guys would be excited about um, are talking about all the different live potentials that we have. So I think we'll do a thousand sub live thing and we'll maybe do like some giveaways in that little campaign. And it's just basically to get us like more interaction um, and more engagement with you guys. Um, not like face to face, but I think you know what kind of what I mean. So look forward to that. And thank you guys so much. Um, Another thing that I want that I feel like um, is part of our celebration and part of this sort of thousand subs thing is that we have our merch store. I don't want to bore people with too much like housekeeping or whatever. So I'm trying to get through it, but I really do love the way that the merch turned out. So we have the Thema Mundi gem gear. This is like my sweatshirt. I needed to test it, of course, and I'm super pumped about it. But another um, clothing line that I've been working on for quite a while, and Chris actually helped me a little bit with this, is our Planetary Days gear. So I do, you know, planetary day um, worship or pra I have a practice of planetary days and I dress in planetary day clothing and have for many, many years now. So we have like a planetary day gear line where you can get like Saturday black Saturn gear. And it's a little bit like discreet because we, we don't have like the planetary symbol or say Saturn on there. We have the Greek name. So it's like Greek lettering. So it's like slightly discreet as well, you know? So it's not just like, hey, I'm an astrologer, but you can kind of rep that planetary gear and it makes it easy for you to just like get dressed or do like a special ritual in like your Saturn hoodie or whatever, you know? So um, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, and I have a website that's going to be coming out soon that is going to offer a couple variations on that. But if you want to check out the store, I'll put it in the links and I would appreciate it. It's a way to support the channel. Um, yeah, I think that's it. You guys want to dive in? Yeah, let's do it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So Firmicus Maternus Mathesis. Today we're here to bring you um, the full of book one and probably part most of book two. Um, we're kind of going to break it up as we are throughout the study group, but we're just going to see how, you know, this flows for us, um, bringing you little pieces or little overviews of parts that we've worked with. Um, so we're not going to cover 
all of book two today. So book one and a portion of book two. We did have a slideshow prepared. What I wanted to let you guys know is if anyone knows how to do the gallery view while you're presenting, that would be great. Um, let us know in the comments below. I've been trying to figure that out here for a while, but we're not actually going to present it because otherwise you can't see all of our faces and our interactions. So we're, we, we're working on that as well in, uh, to make it like easy for you guys to follow along with some visuals. But for now, uh, you'll just have to hear us going back and forth just from the book. Um, so book one, In Defense of Astrology, the first entire book, um, Maternus is just, you know, letting us know like where it's at. He is you know, as Christopher, maybe I should just invite you to step forward with your first sort of notes about how he approaches the topic. Yeah, I think, you know, what's interesting about it, of course, is that for, you know, a classical document, right? So this is an astrology manual that comes to us, you know, from fourth century. And I think is the first of its kind in the sense that um, he actually has that first chapter that says why astrology you know effectively is like let's talk about this and you think about it you know we may be used to that by picking up a book today on astrology and it might think like why in our materialist world would you be deigned to explore this strange art of astrology you know let me explain to you why this is legitimate and in fact Perhaps that's the first of its kind, right? This is this piece from Maternus. It's like the very first, why astrology and why is it legitimate? And so. And I kind of I, talked a little bit about the times too. Like there is needing to be a defense of astrology. And also Maternus is like a lawyer. So he's going to be like, okay, just to start out in case anyone's about to refute this, like we've got that part covered. Let's just get that out of the way in the first chapter. Yep. And then I, what's interesting too about this is that um, he defends astrology on its own terms, as in he doesn't go into the other field's camp. And, um, you know, you know, whenever, and you, you have this, every time you get engaged in a conversation with somebody about something where they have a point of view, um, you're on always terrible footing if you adopt their frame and try to argue against them. Right. And so he, he points out the other frame, he says, look at that, and says, but the frame is here in the astrology and the art and here's yeah. where the frame works and this is our defense on our own terms and we're not going to sit there and go but this and but that against something that's not even a collective worldview from where astrology is birthed from yep yeah that's really awesome and i mean the basic if you guys are not reading along and you just want like an overview for me like the easiest overview besides that which is a really great point is just that he's a little bit sort of arguing for fate, right? So it's a lot of fate and free will happening in this chapter, right? And he's saying, if astrology or fate isn't real, then why do bad things happen to good people and do good things happen to bad people? And he goes on to give examples, like someone could just be like wretched, deceitful and wiling out and they get all the credits and all the money and they're not sort of like excluded for their bad behavior. In fact, they're sort of raised on high and someone could be pious and sweet it's kind of like the nice guys finish last or whatever it's like you could be sweet and pious and generous and all of that and still you know die of some like horrific thing and not be upheld by in any kind of honors or status by your community or in fact even taken advantage of so that's kind of like his i mean this is a basic <laughs> basic thing to sort of like overview this as but in a sense that's what i've gleaned most from his sort of examples mm -hmm. for fate is just like look at how sort of imbalanced this is and then how can this ast ast astrology describe that perfectly and then the fact that that happens at all should be a good cause for us to understand that that's fate happening there yeah and he, and he specifically it's kind of interesting in that is that he he takes important historical figures of the day right so there's Sulla the um uh the the dictator in the um during the late republican period who was just brutal and ruthless but you know died a natural old death and 
uh, or Socrates, right? The the you know the Platonic hero of you know this man of virtue poisoned by the community, um, executed, or Alcibiades, another interesting character from Greek history uh, that did these outrageous things like selling out the Athenians during the Peloponnesian War um, and still being able to be a prominent citizen in Athens afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah um, you know, really relatable. I think those those kind of that ground of like, hey, fate guys is very relatable, right? To yeah. our times or whatever. Like you see people just while and out where if you did half of what that person did, everyone would just think that you, that you were just, you know, debauched or something like that. But they, for some reason, get to just go forth and prosper. So that kind of unfair like idea of like you don't get the karma in the moment and you may not like see all of your good deeds come to immediate fruition or something like this is like a very solid base for why you might you know take a look at a fatalistic approach yep Um, another thing more kind of towards the end of the chapter is that Um, You know, once we move past this idea that like, okay, maybe fate is a real thing because we see this unfairness of outcomes, regardless of the action that we put into it. um, It's this one paragraph on page 96 that I think is really cool where he starts talking about um, where, you know, we can agree, or at least people in his day could agree that fate would rule over certain things like death, like we're all going to, you know, meet this same end, right? And then knowing that, then people want to sort of have it both ways where they'll say, okay, the end is certain, but everything up until that point is um, sort of in the hands of men. So this is kind of a long quote, but I think it's a good one. He says, for in fact, they want what they call Hamar Mene to be connected to the nature of men and the rest of ensouled things by a certain association. And since we are so made and begotten that living for a certain amount of time, once the course of life is completed, And after the fragility of the body is dissolved away, we are born back to that divine spirit which sustains us. They want us to be subjectly by fate and our lot, so that one and the same end point of disillusion will destroy us and all ensouled things by this fatal law. But they want all things which pertain to the course of life to be put in our own power, so that what we live is our own life, but that we seem to die in virtue of fate and our lot alone. And this to me strikes me as like a very common, um, like, oh, you know, traditional astrology is so brutal and like fatalistic and rule bound. Like I want my free will. I don't want to be bound by, you know, Saturn squaring Mercury in my chart. I want to, you know, feel like I've done this. Um, And so I just think it's really funny that this kind of wanting it both ways has been going on forever and ever because, you know, anytime we read a chart, what we're saying is you are kind of bound to these outcomes. um, And that's the way that it needs to be. If we're going to accept that astrology is something that we can do. Yeah. And like now we find solace in astrological magic and like thing, like ideas like that, that are like, what is in this sort of like liminal realm, but that also existed at the time where it was like, you are fated, but you could, you know, do heroic deeds or petition the gods or do like certain things that if you you had a strong enough, I guess, will or sort of uh, motivation or something like that, that potentially you the, go- the gods could shine down upon you and you could perhaps um, have some kind of conversation with them to maybe not release you from your fate or something like this. Uh, But, you know, I think this is part of the reason, like, why free will or even Christianity, I think, took off so much is because, you know, it's a double edged sword where they, they, at the time, I'm sure, to be liberated from your fate and, and think of things as like your own free will was like a sweet idea. But like, if you think it all the way out, perhaps doesn't have as much, uh, you know, I guess, boons for the native as they would want to hope with their free will, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So it is kind of like a push and pull. And I am going to be doing a episode in the future here about fate and free will with a special guest, which I'm really excited about. So I think we'll get a little bit more into like the nitty gritty of this, because obviously it's not as 
sweet and cut and dry as we can just say right now, right here. Um, go ahead, Christopher. I was going to say, it's interesting to note that Firmicus does point out certain problems that if everything is as locked in and predetermined, right? Even though he's in favor, he's, he's definitely leaning towards a heavy degree of determinism. He does point out the flaw with that is that if everything is determined, then I don't have to manage my moral self at all because the stars have already determined what it's going to do. So if I'm going to go out and do bad things, guess that was fated. And if I'm going to go out and do good things, that was fated too. And, um, you know, and, and so there's this, he, he does weave this very delicate thread of working through the problem of determinism um, and, and the idea of where does agency occur in the individual? Like, you know, so you have this great mechanism of the stars driving us to this, you know, these, these, this, to our final resting place, right? Because that's the piece. Everyone agrees. Oh, I can't say when you're born, definitely can't say when you're going to die. Maybe there's something you can do about it in between. But even then, as he points out, there's all these different factors, right? That at the time of your death, what led to the moment before your death and the moment before that and the moment before that. And he asks the question, where was your agency? But he also points out that if it's completely determined, we have no will in it. Um, where does the where where does moral excellence come from? What's the point? And he he, he makes an attempt to address those questions. And honestly, if you want to try and work it out and really sit down and sit with it, read the chapter and take a look because it's worth it's worth actually kind of chewing on these things and thinking about it. If you're into astrology and you're into traditional astrology, this is definitely the material to kind of get into and sink your teeth into and start working out. Um, so you're not actually in that p position of being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you the see that you know, it's like it's like when, when you start getting into certain, you know, astrological techniques. And if you're a hardcore free will person and you see this, the astrology play out in a clearly deterministic way, it's uncomfortable. By the same token, if you're a hardcore determinist and you see agency show up in the individual, the chart, that's also uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think there is like a beautiful and happy medium somewhere in there with, with the worldview that Firmic is, I feel like captures really well here, but it's interesting because even if you're not an astrologer, like I know maybe some people are here for tarot because our first series had to do with tarot, but I know that fate and free will is just a hot topic these days for anyone. Right. And you hear these conversations and these same defenses or these same sort of problems coming up in the modern conversations. Like I just listened to a really good podcast about that um, recently where they're like, okay, so let's say everything is completely determined. Where this falls apart is why I should even get out of bed in the morning then. Why go to work? Why do anything? Or why not just rob, steal, cheat, and philander or whatever it is? Because I could easily just toss that into fate. And then also what because then it starts to talk about like, well, then I feel free will. There's an I here. There's an I that's like making some kind of a choice to get out of bed, brush the teeth or not. Well, if they're going to rot out, they're going to rot out. <laughs> so it's like, you know, there's there's something to be said here that's like very beautiful and very nuanced. And I think Firmicus does a good job at pointing to it in this chapter. Go ahead. Oh, well, what was what's actually really remarkable is that, you know, the, the worldview that Firmicus is working from, it's this kind of, you know, very kind of closed cosmology. And yet in our current modern rationalist, you know, the, the, the what Chris Warnock, for instance, would call the atheistic materialism, um, there's no free will there either, right? You see that mm -hmm. the cutting edge, you know, people about, we're just basically bags of meat cells bouncing around <laughs> you have no no control over how we do anything and yet and so you wonder like well is there a virtue is there an element to virtue and yet you see people who manage themselves people who actually you know exercise some modicum of self-restraint some modicum of agency right can really prevail in a in a sea of chaos so the what's uh, the, the sort of remarkable thing is that the debate is still there it's still the same it's just that some of the out external framing has changed yeah, and I think that it shows in, like, if someone had, like, a hardcore atheist materialist worldview, and maybe, maybe this is a bad example, but, um, like, 
very science-based mind, right? So then you see that in cellular experiments that you actually have the observer effect, <laughs> which kind of is messy when you when it comes to this, right? Which is like, oh, it's just all sort of like cells doing these like random chaotic things, but they will do different things if observed or whatever. And you're like, actually, oh. not only that, they'll do different things depending on who's observing. Who's observing? No, right? I know. You know, so then this touches a little bit on that. And I think you know, not to sort of be too wishy-washy with like science and all these different sort of like worldviews here, but like there's a delicacy to the idea of like the Eastern karma where there is a, a destiny and a fate, but you, karma is like the band-aid or the fixer, like whatever it is a little bit for this sort of like agency idea, which is like, you still have the opportunity to take yourself, you know, off the wheel of suffering through long and enduring sort of micro choices of spirit that sort of like move mm -hmm. through you and move you towards <clears throat> the faded good or something, you know? So anyway, <clears throat> that's think, well, the maybe a final point is that yeah. and we're not really going to talk about this today, um, but we talk a lot about in astrology we talk about necessity right so there's the chart will display things that will happen right and then we have a range of choices within what will happen um and we've talked a lot about you know just privately about things like the lot of courage or the lot of spirit right where there's and you're talking about like there's this you can have this like disposition of spirit that will point you towards you know different desires or outcomes that you would like and you can make choices in alignment with that but then ultimately how in your control really is it how those outcomes come to fruition um that's a great point matt when we're not just talking about fate and free will but we look at it from the astrological perspective because it is built into our system actually it the fate the free will and the fate and free will are both built into the system because of the sun and the moon because mm -hmm. of the lot of fortune and the lot of spirit there's things that befall you that you don't it's just like where you happen to live the the parents mm -hmm. you happen to have like whatever mm -hmm. it is the environment that you're raised in like just s happens or whatever is built into the chart and then there's this other sort of like philosophy a lot of spirit and it's um you know lots that show that it's moved by the person's inner fire their inner agency their sort of like will to achieve like a certain type of disposition that they might have towards something um so that's really beautiful and interesting that yeah and i think then another layer on that that is makes me laugh sometimes is that okay now i can read my own someone's desire from this lot of spirit right so who's to say how um you know like where does the the free will really become born out of like is that also an extended sort of product of circumstance and then we're kind of back to square one well i think i think there if you push either the free will or determinism to their natural extremes they start to look like each other yeah there we go yeah there's something really kind of so, so it's like if everything is my free will then i've chosen everything and i've got everything that i chose um and if i have if i have no choice in the matter then i have everything that i didn't choose um, and I would even choose, I would even not choose to choose those things, right? This is like, I'd be compelled to choose these things. So I have the experience of choosing, right? Um, and, and it's, but it's, you know, so again, we, we start running into those questions like, well, if I was being compelled to choose this, did I really choose it? Right, you know, if right. I'm being compelled to good behavior, is it really good behavior? Um, right, which right. is like, what, for, well, bring it back to Firmicus, that's like one of the questions yeah. he asked. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's like the, I've, I've, you know, more times than I can count, I will be, you know, craving something, having a desire of something, being in the mood to like, you know, go do a specific thing. And then I check, you know, one or two different timing techniques and I'm like, oh yeah, that's the day for this. Right. And so then it's like, I really want this thing. I experience that as a spontaneous desire, but it arises at a moment that is appropriate for that desire. Right. Um, and so it's kind of this, you know, looping circle in my mind. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I feel like I really liked the first chapter of Maternus. I felt like he did a good job at pointing us to some of the things and that also that we see 
happening still in the fate and free will debate, although astrology has sort of been dropped off from that a long time ago. And I think it's more interesting for astrologers and more interesting in the context of astrology here in the book. I'm loving this book so far, to be honest. I've read through book two. Um, and what's really interesting, this, I guess, spoiler alert for next sewed when we cover the end of book two or whatever, but I've been, I was really inspired about the end of book two because he almost implores you to sort of like have a yogic mind about these things. Like actually, especially because you're being given this sort of like sacred passage of an astrologer that it matters so much how we conduct ourselves with inside of the community. And we're going to go over that on a deeper level uh, in our next recording um, when that comes out for the end of book two. But I just wanted to like add that in there because it comes back around not only with like agency, but just like conduct. And it's not necessarily like this like moral, like whatever conduct, but he's just like basically saying we have like this really beautiful and sacred sort of like contract with the work um, and to conduct ourselves in a certain type of way. So look forward to that because it's really juicy. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's dive past book one. So book two, we get um, we get a lot in book two, actually, of just the basic layout of astrology i was gonna say um time to close the can of worms <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> move on to the other can yeah anyway it's here's, not here's like <laughs> <laughs> it's not like we're not going to come back to this i have <laughs> specifically asked a very a certain someone to have this fate and free will talk and they're prepping in the background because I think it's important. And, and before I even got to this chapter of Maternus, we've been kind of throwing around having that conversation um, about worldview and then fate and free will. So anyway, yeah, just a quick fate and free will moving on. Um, <laughs> Back in the can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, book two, uh, we really get a bunch happening straight out of the gate. And then he does tell us, um, let me see if I can see this here. He says, quote, um, for the present, we have stated these things enough in the book of principles. So he's talking about, you know, where, where we are so far. He's basically laying out that, um, but when it comes to the Apotel's Mata, we state everything first broadly, and then with a fine interpretation, showing them together in an easy outline, lest any nervous doubt hinder the science of making pronunciation. So that's towards the middle to the end of this chapter. And he's basically just saying, I'll lay out these concepts and techniques briefly here. And then throughout the rest of the book, I'm going to answer all of your questions about like all, but what if this and what if that and what if this and what if that? And I will go into it throughout the rest of the book. But for right now, I'm giving you sort of the general layout of the principles. And he really does. So in book one, we or in book two, I'm sorry, in book two, we are going to see the 12 signs, the domiciles, you know, Deccan, sect, and we're going to go through these um, piece by piece now. You know, before we, before we go into this, it might be worth discussing the term apotelismata. Oh, yeah. Shall we? You want to give us a little primer? Yeah, because because this is a, I think uh, Ben makes a comment of this in his, um, or Ben Dykes makes a comment of this in his introduction. Yeah. And and we have a number of classical astrological texts that have just simply this title, Apotelismata. And it is, it's, it, it, it comes about, it's talking about the end or the results of things, how things manifest. And um, there's an art to the astrology, like you may have discovered if you're new to the art, if you're just starting to practice or if you've been practicing for a few years, Sometimes very hard to see how things are going to come out when you're looking at a chart. And we can say, oh, I've got a planet here. I've got, a, you know, Mercury in Virgo, or I've got, you know, Venus in Scorpio or whatever, right? You can look at these things and say, oh, but what does that mean? It's like, well, it means this, whatever that means, like depending upon the house and the placement. But it's like, what is the outcome going to look like? Apotelismata is about outcomes. 
And I think that's really, really critical because mm -hmm. I feel like even for astrologers, maybe not as much of our traditional astrologers, but even for beginning traditional astrologers, that is the hard part. That is the part yeah. where it's almost uncomfortable, even for a beginning astrologer and astrologer. It's like, okay, so like, you know, Venus in Scorpio, she, she's kind of like this is happening to her and like whatever. And then the client's like, but what does that mean for me? And also when? And then you know <laughs> beads of sweat <laughs> so yeah i think that's a really good point christopher and and so when you look at how he's organized the book right this so book one is about why astrology book two he introduces what he calls the principles and he just he's laying out the map he's saying here are signs as you're saying here are the stars here's where they're you know going through the whole list which we're about to talk about like he's he's orienting you to the basic things to know about what are the tools the astrologer is going to be using to come to results okay. and he's not going to tell you, he's going to promise like he promises several times like just just follow me here <laughs> Right. Yeah, like just chill for a second. Like, here's the basics, and then we're gonna get into like, and Lord does he. I don't want to reveal like one of my favorite parts in the book because it's at the very end, and I don't want you guys to skip. But you know, he really does justice to some of the um nitty gritty in this book. Some of the things you would want to know in the nitty gritty. So he jumps right in. He jumps right in. Uh the first uh, let me get my book handy here. So he sort of starts out in book two by saying we need primary principles. Uh, we need to be shaped by the right principles. Um, we um, He kind of criticizes that, you know, a lot of people don't really tell us they might tell us the stuff but not about the teaching themselves or the, not about the sort of um deeper kind of like underlying philosophy they'll just say this means this and move on and he's tr basically trying to say that i'm going to do more than that essentially um and he says here that uh he then because everybody else just kind of lays it out and doesn't he doesn't feel like it's a good enough job um he says, we'll translate everything that the Egyptians and Bab Babylonians said about this art. Um, and then goes on to talk about a few things about the shadow degrees, which we can sort of skip for now. But then he just goes, okay, 12 signs. Um, so he says, we have the five planets uh, along with the sun and the moon. So he lists them. And then he goes on to categorize the masculine and feminine signs. Um so that's the first sort of category categorization that he does for us with the signs. Yep. And then, um, and I think I'll have Christopher or Matt, you know, go on to say the names, but we've got the beautiful names of the planets where he says, you know, um, the Egyptians do not call the stars by the same names which the Greeks do. And then he goes on to let us know what the Egyptians call the planets. So, Christopher, you want to yeah. test that for me? So, so, when he, so in this chapter, this is a 2-2 where he's, where he's giving which signs rule which, which planets rule which signs. And he points out that the Greeks and the Romans have a system of names that are derived from, you know, the Greek and Roman gods. And we all know who those are. Um, and then he goes on to say, but the Egyptians had different names. Um, interestingly enough, all the Egyptian names are Greek names. They're Greek words. But um, in the earliest versions of the material, we see this, right? So he has Saturn. It's called by the Egyptians Phinon, or the Shining One. What we call Jupiter, he says, the Egyptians call Phython, the Bright or Brilliant One. Uh, Mars is... Um, Pyroes, Venus is Phosphorus, and Mercury is Steelbone. And when you think about it, the, each of these Greek terms, right? You know, you have Saturn is the shining one, Jupiter is the bright one, Mars is the fiery one, Venus is the light bearer, Phosphorus, and Mercury is the sparkling one, Steelbone. And that's, yeah, kind of like what they did in the sky. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's beautiful. And we see this, I think uh, Dimitri gives us these names in her book, but I just think it's really beautiful to kind of um, lay them out again. And there's some of probably the earliest names and just to say their names is awesome. And then he goes on to say uh, the five planets each have two signs, right? They have one masculine and the other feminine. So again, we're covering the very basics of the system here straight out of the gate. Um, and then he lists those, right? And we don't need to go through that. So now he lays out the heights and the dejections of the stars. He says, we ought to know the height and the humiliation of the individual stars. And I want you guys, uh, we might end up saying, but let's use our astrological skills here for a second. Uh, why don't you guys comment down below, what are the heights and the dejections of the stars? What are the height and the humiliation places for the stars? Let us know in the comments below. Um, and we will go on and end up maybe saying it or whatever. But if you're at this point, go ahead and let us know in the comments below. What are the heights and the dejections? Uh, the humiliation. He goes on to say um, there that there's a form of being raised up, a certain natural loftiness or greatness here. Um, and then also there's a place where men are crushed by misfortunes or unluckiness when the star falls in that place. Um, anything you guys want to add about this? I'll just say all I have to do is look at your chart. If you got one of these planets... <laughs> That are, um, <laughs> that are humiliated i think you know the experience um, yeah. so. um something that i thought was kind of cool that I'm, and i'm trying to find it exactly now um so so he talks about um and it's the second paragraph in this um so he says and so being established in their heights and the heights are and we have a modern term for this um certain places signs where each planet is and specifically degrees but a lot of times we take it to be the whole sign as well, where the planet will be either raised up and then opposite of that, it will be um, cast down. Um, and so he says, and so being established in their heights, they rejoice. And then the trappings of greatest luckiness are decreed whenever the majority of the stars in the nativities of men possess the signs of their heights portionally. Um, so I've just never heard it really emphasized like that, that what you're looking for with these is like, multiple and then it will sort of confer this height this excellence this um you know there's another e word <laughs> um that will sort of distribute itself throughout the life um, and i thought that was just an interesting thing that he emphasized that i haven't seen often elsewhere so um there's an astrologer who did a talk that I thought was really beautiful about this um gray crawford about this topic um about what it might be like, or basically it, it felt like inspiring for those of us who may have planets that are dejected and, you know, uh, cast out or something like this, um, sort of embarrassed or what does he use? What's the word he uses? Humiliated, the humiliated. humiliated. Yes. Yeah. Remember, yeah. humiliated. The height yeah, and yeah. the humiliation, yeah. Yeah, this sort of humiliation place for the planets of sort of the wisdom or the, um, I guess I could just stick with wisdom of the planets that they might gain in that place of humiliation and why they're sort of humiliated there. Like, um, so it was just a really beautiful kind of like nuanced way of looking at that sort of humiliation piece because it's easy to think of something on high as just being sort of like lofty and at its, at its best, like its principles are able to become like very, um, I'm trying to like not use the name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read a quote and use it in about five yeah. seconds. Oh, no. you're about to use yeah. it. Yeah. But something being sort of like worshipped on high or something like yeah. this, something yeah. being yeah. like, oh, all the exemplary like qualities are able to sort of be supported by the sign or by the, you know, by that place that it's in. Um, and that's pretty straightforward because you see a planet and it's like, oh, where they would most be functioning and where they're like supported by the general principles of their, um, their work or something. Yeah. 
But when a planet is sort of cast out or dejected, yeah, you can say, oh, it's bad. And the person can probably feel that if the nativity is like their own. But it's another thing to sort of see how that plays out because you do see very interesting things when it comes to dejection or humiliation or something like that in charts. So yep. it's like you can see someone with a dejected planet or many and the significations of that planet still arise, you know? Right. So it's what, very interesting. I think for me, what's also fascinating is what we're talking about dejections um, or any, any terrible configurations on the chart is that they are the most interesting thing to look at in many ways. You know, it's like no one, I mean, very few people, I, I can't say no one, but no one's going to come to an astrologer saying, hey, by the way, can you show me why my life is going so well at the moment? Um, they People come to an astrologer it's like, what's not working in my life and why? <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, it's the people with Jupiter in Cancer in the second house never come to me with money problems. <laughs> yeah. Maybe like, where do I invest all of right. my money? Right. I have too much money. <laughs> I've got too much money. I don't know what to do with it. No. Yeah, but it's it's like, you know, I was just thinking about that when I was working on um I was doing some 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 recent work and I was just noticing how how really dull the happy things are in the chart. Like, you know, the really the the kind of nuts and bolts and and and, and perhaps the wisdom, but the the excellence of actually looking at like these fallen places worth looking at because really you yeah. get the you get a visceral feel of the astrology unfolding. Yeah. You get this very sort of cathartic and you know poetic kind of like pushing through where it's like if you have Mercury and Pisces, for instance, there's many Mercury and Pisces people who are writers and even mm -hmm. famous writers. So it's like, wow, how does that really cultivate through a sort of um, being away from the natural proclivity or environment or something just being handed to you easily? And like, how do you cultivate right. there? And it's not like someone in the schlag of, let's say, poverty or something like this of a certain want that's not a great experience for them, but the wisdom and the cultivation that can happen there and the sort of beauty that can sort of be, I don't know, chipped away at or, or you know, not to, I'm not trying to like make it sound more beautiful than it is, but what can be cultivated from that shows up in many different stories in the life of natives who have this. And I think Gray Crawford, I mean, I watched it a long time ago, so shout out to Gray, but does a good job illustrating this nuance in their talk. So, and it's, I think it's available, you know, out there. So check that out. So go and ahead. I Matt. think, I think maybe a, a point um, to go back to here is the, the point of outcomes, right? Where, when we're looking at, let's say someone with Mercury and Pisces, we're going to get a very different outcome if that mercury is surrounded by other factors that sort of bring it down and prevent a good outcome. So if it's mercury and Pisces in the 12th square Saturn averse to Jupiter, can't see Venus either, right? It's going to be, have a lot more trouble sort of coming through. But then if we have mercury with Jupiter, you know, trying from Venus averse to malefics of sect, right? Then that Mercury and Pisces will be experience the humiliation of that, but then also have an opportunity to create good outcomes for the native, right? Yeah, you have to take these things like very nuanced. And yeah. obviously, we're not trying to give like a big thing on this, but it's very nuanced because I have a, a chart, a client, um, a friend who has a Pisces rising with mm -hmm. Mercury and Pisces, right? So Mercury is in its joy in the first house, but by default, Mercury is representing the partner in which the partner would be an exalted, right? Mm -hmm. And their partner has done wonders for them and really lifted them up and really loves them so much and really was a big um, inspiration for the Native as well. So it was like a very big boon for the partner to be in their house, sort of. Mm -hmm. if their partner is a very exalted person and very loving and kind to them and really helped lift them out of um, a place of dejection maybe. So I just feel like mm -hmm. there's, there's nuance, the houses and like all this stuff anyways. And, you know. Well, so one more quick point is that, and I won't go to specifics, but you will find this a lot where like in my own chart, I have the planet in its fall, the planet in its exaltation and the domicile Lord all in the same sign. Right. And the planet that's fallen rules my first, and it's a planet that I use 
all the time for things that we're doing right now for um you know going to school it just it's a very big part of my life and that is something that is um not always like easier when i was like super young but then through time has become you know a great boon um, yeah it's, it's like a, a lot cultivation these... it's going to take a lot yeah. more to sort of cultivate yeah. and work with the dichotomy of that energy right, right. yeah um and so finally there's this idea of um and i'm going to use the term this is uh i'll just read this quote it says on page 108 uh, for this reason, and we won't get into exactly what that reason is, the, the Babylonians wanted these signs in which the individual stars are exalted to be their houses, saying that the domicile of Saturn is in fact Libra, that of Jupiter Cancer, that of Mars Capricorn, that of the Sun Aries, that of the Moon Taurus, that of Venus Pisces, and that of Mercury Virgo. So this is, um, we see this concept come before the like domicile and whatever people whatever word people choose to use for like the opposite of the domicile um, where we see in the chapter just before this, that we have all of the domiciles listed, but we have no mention of, you know, it's a bad thing to be opposite the domicile. Um, yeah. So there's so much there to unpack. This was the yeah. most important, like in most exciting part of the chapter for me as well. <laughs> Not just that it is saying the exaltation of the house is, preceded the the domiciles as we know them so like jupiter sagittarius and pisces versus jupiter cancer and it pre like it was the original home like there was one original home and that home was the exaltation and we've right. gone over this a lot in our balance uh reading where you know, he'll refer to the domicile and our minds will just go, oh, you know, the, the masculine and feminine domicile. But there's a lot more nuance happening in the earlier part of the tradition, or maybe not nuance, but a difference here, because we could be referring to the triplicities and we also could be referring to the exaltations. And so I thought it was really important of Firmicus to like lay that out so clearly that mm. actually the Babylonians called these the houses of the planet. Right. These are the rightful houses of the right. planet. Yeah. And and just maybe one last point on this is that we we need to think of the word domicile versus exaltation or height right where if something is in its domicile it's at home it has authority right that's perfectly good when it's at its height or when it's exalted it's being worshipped that's like a totally different connotation and when something is opposite its um, home it's simply outside the home there's no real negative it to be that, longing right? and far away from the home it could know? be right but it, it, it doesn't have the same uh thing as humiliation it's like you're being taken from the pedestal and then cast into the dirt right it's very different different uh connotation and that's actually um consistent with even we're you know also mentioned the balance thing uh balance in it balance um planets in their fall are actually seriously debilitated in balance, but planets in their detriment, and so I often tell me what they call, like when you're in the house opposite of your house, um, he doesn't specifically single that out and say that's a terrible thing. You know, it's obviously better to be in your home than not in your home, right. but the um, being in the fall is terrible. Being exalted is great. Being in the home is good. Being not in a home, eh, not so good. It could be good. It could, yeah, it could. And be that right. came later in the tradition. I just, yeah. I think that's yeah. worth pointing out is like the whole anti domicile thing when we're thinking of the domiciles as the masculine and feminine domiciles, we're actually just taking the concept of exaltation and fall and applying it to the domicile, anti domicile, like later in the tradition. Yeah saying like it would make sense with this sort of schema that that would be the case and right. and that's totally fine it totally does yeah it makes sense yeah but but i also just want to point out that like he's he's literally saying like here's the signs and the planets that rule them masculine and feminine wise but just so you know before us right the houses right. were actually these quote-unquote exaltation houses mm -hmm. so please keep that in mind everyone that it came later in the tradition that we sort of like honored them as exaltation houses but it was very standard that that alone was their house yeah. like and, in the Babylonian tradition and, and like you said like there's like 
so much more like we could talk about this and have for so long um there's a lot to unpack in this this one concept really really and it's cool that we see it explicitly just like stated so easily in Firmicus like just kind of so you know clear and out there or whatever all right so um onward then so then I'm, we're going to kind of breeze through. Obviously, we're not going to cover every chapter of Firmicus Maternus as we go through, but we're going to give you sort of like the layout of like what to expect in the book if you don't have one and maybe entice you to get it. Um, so we've got him describing the Deccans. Um, we've got the three parts of the sign here in equal portions. Um, and what I thought was interesting is he said certain people um, wanting to explain the Deccans more subtly would apply three divine powers to each individual Deccan. And he called them duty officers, right? Uh, these three duty workers per Deccan. So that would mean there is nine gods through the sign, three per Deccan. So um, we've got the three equal portions of one sign. So 10 portions to each Deccan. And then we've got that just sort of like interesting side note where he says, you know, we've got, you know, some say that there was three gods per sign that sort of would be, or per Deccan that would be sort of like on duty. So I thought that was really cool because in reading some of the Deccan stuff, we, or if you guys are watching my Deccan uh stuff on Instagram, right? I'll be like, you know, I choose one of the names of the gods just to like not make it confusing, but there's a lots of names attributed to the Deccan themselves. Go ahead, Chris. It's um Dimitri gives a great talk on this. Yeah. And um in 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 it she kind of lays out so the Deccans come to us by way of the Egyptians as a way of dividing up the sky, perhaps as timekeeping associated with certain stars. We don't know which stars because stars move even though we say they don't because they're fixed stars right um but then there's these different traditions depending upon which stage in the egyptian history you're looking at where they've got one set of deacon gods i've got another set of deacon gods i've got another set and so it's possibly what firmicus is trying to do here is he's come he's been looking at some of these manuscripts you know firmicus is in sicily um, a Greek colony. He probably had access to a pretty decent library. It was Sicily, you know, Syracuse is one of the more prominent cities in the ancient world. And he's looking at these and trying to make sense of them. He's like, well, these sets of gods. <laughs> yeah, but I think he's even maybe potentially saying more here that, you know, so I thought that was interesting. You guys can decide for yourself. We're not going to belabor this too much. But of course, there's many, many sets of gods, but he's saying certain people actually gave three per decan so not three per sign one per decan but three per decan which is really cool and then he goes on to say basically um that even the greeks attempted to attain secrets of this discussion i.e the discussion of the decans um but he said they left behind a treat the treatment of the decans with a certain snobbish uh pretended like ignorance right so Again, it's kind of speaking to the Deccans being like a pre-Greek Babylonian, like more pagan or Egyptian or like something like this, right? Where they yeah. were kind of like, oh, well, it's, you know, just the Deccans, like, meh, like kind of snobbish towards like that part of the tradition. And you can sort of see that, you know, being carried on throughout the tradition. Mm-hmm. On that note, um, actually, and he's speaking to something that, that, that is a dynamic you can actually see in... Um, now it's not Greek like we're when we think about Greek, we're not talking necessarily about the ancient Greeks of Athens, right? The but we're talking more about the um post-Macedonian Greeks who were controlling the you know the eastern Mediterranean, um, you know, like the the Greeks who were in charge of the Egyptians, Ptolemies, and etc. And the one of the one of the, this is well documented is that the Greeks that were in charge viewed, you know, like today we view the Egyptian mysteries as like, oh, you know, we kind of like get overwhelmed and in awe about how beautiful the mythology is and the cosmology. And the Greeks viewed it as a sort of animistic claptrap that was like beneath them. And um, so 
Can anyone so, say appropriation? So it's kind of like that. Like, like, right. All these, like pagan, like people. It's, it's like, so we, we couldn't, we can't say pagan because they're all pagans from our perspective, right? Right. Because, because the people in charge are saying all these pagans, right? But the, but, you know, one of the pieces is that, you know, we know there's documented stuff about the deacons, how they're used and what they're doing with them. And we also know, and we see this like in the hermetic literature that comes out of the early, you know, um, classical, the, the kind of early Roman, Egyptian Roman period, that they viewed this stuff with a lot of suspicion and, you know, saw it as basically the sort of barbaric ramblings of the unhinged mind as opposed to some elegant philosophically inspired metaphysic. Right. And he's in it, in it, in it, it shows up even now in the way the Deccans are sort of like presented throughout the tradition. But I think it's interesting that Firmicus, even this early, just I feel like I love him for like laying stuff out plain. Like he'll always just have like a paragraph at the end being like, people are snobbish and look down on the Deccans. Like that's the general like mm -hmm. vibe. And he mm -hmm. just like lays it out like that. And he does that in many cases uh, throughout the book. And I think it's cool. I like it. He's like, just for the record, people look down on the Deccans like with a snobbery kind of. And it's and like that, and that looking down the Deccans continued all the way to the Renaissance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. exactly. They're like one point, whatever. And even now we don't know what to do with yeah. them, right? And it shows that it's a remaining piece prior to this sort of like, you know, philosophical like boxery that we do with like Hellenistic astrology or whatever. Not to say right. you know, to put down Hellenistic astrology. Okay. So it's it's pointing to the pre part of the tradition and a really cool part of the tradition that I'm glad has lived on even with the snobbery. Okay, so on to the portions. So then we've got he will cover the portions of the signs. So we have thirty portions per sign, right? And the decans are ten portions uh, equally split throughout the thirty portions of each sign. And then he goes on to talk about the bounds and give a bound table. Of course, the Egyptian bounds covered here. Um, he goes on to talk about the sect of the stars and like where the stars, quote unquote, rejoice. Now, we're not talking about the planetary joys or the exact like rejoicing conditions, but he does touch on some of the quote unquote, like rejoicing by hemispherical situation when he's talking about rejoicing by sect, essentially. Right. Yeah. There's the star, the, the day stars are happy when they're in the day and the night stars are happy when they're in the night. Um, yeah. And he know, says some stuff here that's like a little disturbing also like on that piece, but okay, fine. I'm going to just pass. Oh, no, no you, you laid it out there. You lay it on us. <laughs> disturbing. Well, he just goes on to say that, like, you know, even if Venus in Libra is like in a day chart, it's not going to be like, this is my, this is my example or whatever. It's, it's still going to bring like all this folly and like misfortune and stuff like that. And it's not, mm -hmm. it's not going to be able to do much. And he gives a nighttime example of like Jupiter or something like that. And it's just like, oh snap, like that's not what we want to hear. We, we want to be like, oh, okay, well, domicile, like pretty good planet. Or he says something about it. Actually, maybe it's like later in the the chapters where he talks about even if a night star is in their domicile in a angle it's actually going to be like all these terrible things and i'm like mm -hmm. oh no because you would think like <laughs> if you have like a good planet even if it's not of sect like it still can do some good but he he's a little bit harsher with it in it's this a, a little like, pessimistic about yeah that's possible yeah, sure. remember yeah. Encountering that. yeah 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 okay so then he goes on to talk about uh the nature of the star the rising of the stars we don't have much on that the, the it seems like maybe they have been lost um what the moon would signify if it was joining a star that we don't have um and he talks a little bit then about like um, the waning of the moon he talks about how he's going to cover it more like later in the book um, <clears throat> and then we move on to uh, morning stars and evening stars so that's about like rising before or after the sun and sort of some delineation factors of that what to look for 
Um, he gives the portions for that, like how many portions away you could call it a morning or evening star. Um, does he talk about the, I think he talks about the burning a little bit here, doesn't he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I should I should I should note that he's we we should probably equate portions. Um, I was just noticing we're talking about portions, and um, he uses the term portions. In fact, a lot of traditional astrologers don't use the term degree. Mm -hmm. And um, so, in in the 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 terms are using kind of speak to this idea of something allotted, something distributed, something passed down to you. Now we use those terms in relationship to degree, but if you really want to think about the astrology on a kind of a more visceral level, it's good to kind of start to step away from the jargon you're comfortable with and play with the, the terms they're using, how they're using them to kind of give you a better sense of what we're, what, what they're talking about. It gives really insightful, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just using like ancient terms to try to set us apart by like snobbery or something like that, or just to be like poetic. I mean, some of it is a little poetic. Um, and it is fun to sort of play with the um, more nuanced like terminology and not to say that the standardization of the terminology isn't helpful. It absolutely can be and is. Um, but yeah, I guess I should have stated that. And sometimes I might push upon it a little. I don't want to say force it, but like, I'll just say portions and I'll be like, oh, people can figure out that that's degrees, but we probably should explicitly state. I mean, that's also why I said you, you know, comment below with the, the heights, you know, cause I want you guys to be able to understand that there's language standards, standardization, but it, which is really helpful as a scaffolding when you're first learning. But then at a certain point, it actually sort of like regresses like some flexibility of the mind to just be like oh heights exaltations right it's, mm -hmm. it actually like it's kind of cool to be like oh an import a, a portion uh is a degree it's an it's a it's a, a portion that i get right um so it's just interesting to sometimes play with the language the way that it's actually given to us and like understand how to assign that on our own right so when she's talking about portions ah she's talking about degrees interesting you know mm -hmm. so i think you know we, we, we want to play with that a little bit yeah and it and it i think the important part in my mind is that it really does reveal something about the concept like when we're thinking of something being exalted we learn more when we can think okay maybe we can think of it as the height or instead of thinking of the fall we think of it as the humiliation like we can flesh out the the concept a little bit more and same thing with portion where um degree and this is from schmidt has more to do with stepping forward right each degree is a step forward and each portion is its own little unit that has been handed right or has been plucked out of a hat right something like that right um, or so it gives a, a different high. sense yeah it gives a different sense to the concept yeah, and obviously Schmidt, who is basically we're all, in, if you're practicing Hellenistic astrology today, you're under the lineage of Schmidt on some level or whatever. Um, but he was like known or even criticized for like doing that too often and too much, mm -hmm. right? Like using, obscuring the language and sort of like going. But if you're into linguistics and you're into that kind of a thing, it can be really fun to sort of play with um, the way something is written, the sort of multivalence of a word, which I think Schmidt would tell us there's like a lot to that and a lot of meaning. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't want to go that far, it is still kind of fun and insightful to just like look oh he doesn't call this exaltations and falls he calls this heights and mm -hmm. rejections mm -hmm. interesting i know i know and what that means or whatever like i know that that means you know so it's just kind of interesting on a malleable brain study moment to to work right. with yeah and not to get too far afield but schmidt makes a, a really uh compelling argument that while this is something that we don't always do in English this like very particular choice of words for like multivalent meanings that was much much more common in Greek um, and people would choose particular words that had particular meanings in a way that we don't quite do it anymore and also sorry <laughs> also to add to that would be like um you know 
in the lineage of Hermes Trismegistus, right? In the lineage of something being maybe slightly occulted or like mm -hmm. even the point is to have it embedded in like a a deeper multivalent seed, um, I think is a is a really rich and should not be ignored part of our tradition coming mm -hmm. from Hermes Trismegistus. So there's something to be said, at least to dabble in that a little bit. Yes. I thought maybe you were going to add yeah, something. Yeah, I thought you were going <laughs> to You looked like you had something to say. <laughs> uh, you know, what I was going to, to, to Matt's point also is that, because um, there, there were Greek words that could describe a certain phenomena, um, that, and the word was only ever used in that context. But instead, and, and granted, we're talking about a Latin text here, um, a Latin text written by a lawyer, somebody who is um, skilled with words. And so we want to understand there's some skill being applied to what words he's choosing to define things. And, and so we see that, you know, in a lot of the Greek texts, we'll see these polyvalent words that are chosen. And oftentimes, I think what Robert Schmidt, the point he makes, and, and I've seen it when I've looked at it in the, in the Greek itself, is that all the meanings could be in play at once. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of that Hermes yeah. thing. Yeah. Pointing to. And just, I know we're going to talk about this in your interview, Christopher, but just for the record, you studied, do study ancient Greek. Is that? Can yeah, you... I, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> when we're looking at some of the Greek and like, you know, when we're talking about your point, exactly, like this is a lawyer, he's trying to choose his words craft craftily crafty um as well as the the polyvalence or multivalence of a word in greek might have been chose on purpose and yes we can all come to one word to sort of understand it in english but it's interesting at very least to sort of look at the multi or the dynamic space in which the word existed you know so okay so we got portions down thanks for noting that portions are degrees everyone <laughs> heights are exaltations everyone <laughs> okay um <clears throat> all right so then we move on to the moral qualities and the natures of the signs so you know, he goes on about like tropical and fiery and different kind of uh, equinoctial, celestial. Um, again, we're not going to go over every chapter deeply in these little talks here. Um, but then he goes on in this part, the nature of the signs. It's almost like a little bit of a delineation or like a, a basic idea of the sign he's like going a little bit deeper into not just the signs are masculine and feminine and this is where they fall and this is is who's ruling them but then he's going on to tell you about you know it's masculine it's celestial it's royal it's fiery so he's delineating a little bit but we mm -hmm. only have aries and pisces all the rest of the signs are missing and it's, terrible. it's possible that that perhaps mavordius was a taurus and he didn't like what he saw yeah, like every, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lollianus was like, oh, I have all those placements, so at new. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we can burn these pages. <laughs> uh -huh. Exactly. These are not useful at all. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so then we've got the essential times of the signs, which, you know, for the Deccans and for the essential signs and for many of these things, we've got... Uh, tables right so then we're going to go on with the ascensional times i don't think we need to talk about the climbs uh the klima uh, yeah the i think i was going to to add to that the for the ascensions um is it one of the things is he's he's not giving a lot of like details he's pointing certain things out because they become critical in techniques later yep. and um and he points out because when he introduced the ascension he points out that everything's kind of at a tilt in the heavens relative to where we sit on earth and so so then, depending on where you are, now he anchors us to cities, but the cities are all these different uh, latitudes. Where you are, you're going to see different. You're going to see different. You know, signs are going to rise at different rates, um, different times of the year. And so, and then, and while he's and like in this first book, there book two. Sorry, the second book is really an orientation. Like, hey, this thing we'll come back to it later, but this thing you want to pay attention to. Right. Like he's just laying out the basics of like what we would know as traditional astrologers in this, which I think is awesome. And he like that quote that I read at the beginning, he's like, for those of you who don't think you can make like proper judgments, just off these things, if you, you still have uh, trepidation about like, 
you know, being able to do anything with this, don't worry, we're going to get to everything in detail, like further, we're just kind of like laying it out, all your questions are going to be answered as we go, probably at nauseam. So just giving us the sort of like backbone, the scaffolding. So then moving on, we've got the signs that are subject to what wins. Now, here we go, guys. <laughs> I'm sure we have things to say about this. Um, so there's there's a really funny footnote in this section um, where the first sentence, and this is chapter two uh, or book two, chapter 12. He says, it is even good for us to know which signs are subject to which winds for this knowledge is greatly necessary for us in Apotelesma. And then there's a footnote that says, Nevertheless, this material does not appear again. Right. This yeah, happens. So it, it really made me laugh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but this happens with Demetra too. She covers the winds, <laughs> and it's different than what we know as the elemental yep. places yep. like today, right? So we have mm -hmm. to like really think about that because when you're thinking about like your classic, I don't even know, Christopher, you can tell us like where this comes from, but we think of like the south as fire, the north as earth, the west as water, and the east as air. Like if just in a in your modern mind through mm -hmm. witchery or whatever. That's kind of like yeah. The I think I think I think a piece of it is that you look at so we've had these groupings of of the signs, the triplicities, right, or the trigons, right? These these four sets of signs that have a relationship to each other where they're 120 degrees apart. And so they form kind of a cohe they, they form a unit in of themselves. And in the early literature, they were often just identified by the first or one of the signs that uh, that de determined the triplicity. The right? Aries triplicity. Right. So we like the Aries triplicity, the Taurus triplicity, the Gemini triplicity, the Cancer triplicity. Indeed. And um, and those were associated with winds. And I think the earliest association was that there's this notion of winds that went with it, like what direction the wind came from or mm -hmm. what direction the wind Right, was. Actually, right. Actually, it's what direction the wind was going to. Um, right. That's and right. then, um, and I always get confused on that. So correct me in the comments. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, please let us know because this is a very – and the reason why I just said it off the bat, those associations, because I just think like in our modern mind, and I don't know where in magical practice we got these sort of associations, if it was like oh, the later like Wicca stuff. I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Go ahead. So, no, but so Valens, like in Valens, which is written a couple hundred years before this text, right? Valens does associate elemental qualities with these with these triplicities, right? He'll say the fiery triplicity, the watery triplicity, the airy triplicity, and the earthy triplicity. Um, Ptolemy uses Aristotelian physics and starts to impose that idea onto the system. And there's a subtle difference in the nature of how the elements are read or interpreted. And in fact, um, you know, Aristotle does describe the elements in his, uh, you know, as a, uh, his books on physics, in particular um, on generation corruption, lays us out like how one element becomes another and transforms. Right, right. But what I'm saying is not necessarily where the the triplicities come from, but when they are associated with specific directions. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's what that that's <laughs> you know. So, so this is where it becomes confusing because if you're like a modern Wiccan person, you're gonna say what I said earlier, right? Like there's this kind right. of just like default mode of like which which direction is associated with which element. So when we're talking about the winds, it's going to be different than your supposition straight out of the gate, probably. So yeah, well, in here in his record in his. Uh, definitions right with the way he lays them out initially the south is earthy and the um, north is fiery but otherwise it makes sense um there that is, a... is flipped yep and, yeah, and that, that flipped. i think that's the same as how demetra has it in her book so if anyone got stuck on the winds there um we see that here and it does make sense in the way that um i understand this is like completely just me like being what this is no basis whatsoever so like the modern could be saying like south if you go like the more south you get the hotter it gets right the more north you get the sort of colder it gets so you could then say oh south fiery but here we see 
obviously the east is bringing in the air the west is where the sun sets over the water okay but the south something that's underneath you would be the ground would be the earth and fire is kind of like moving upward right it has an mm. upward direction so fire being associated with the north uh, moving through mm. to the north winds moving upward Okay, but anyway, we're going over a little over time, and Matt has a prior engagement, which we uh, knew about before. So thanks for joining us for a little while, Matt. We're going to wrap up Christopher and I by ourselves, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Bye. Awesome. Bye. See you next time. Okay, so the winds. All alone. We're all alone with the winds. <laughs> Blowing in the wind. <laughs> yeah. Um, Actually, this is kind of interesting. Uh, we should schedule a time to talk about this topic because there's an interesting thing that shows up in the ceremony magic of the modern ceremony magic that um, takes a look at the dish, this issue and might shed some light on some of the orientation. And and I know Ben makes allusion to it in his notes about. Yeah, let's do that. We flopped that around because it it does. Um, it's an interesting. It's an interesting very interesting way of looking at uh at these directions and um so but it's not firmicus it's just you know as, as ben actually comically points out firmicus lays us out but never comes back in the book nobody ever does and i remember even as a beginner reading demetra's book i was like wait a minute the winds that's different than like how like i thought like not that there's not a lot of difference in like your suppositions when you're getting into um, ancient astrology, but I was just like, huh, that's so fascinating. And I instantly was interested. There's also another girl in one of our study groups who's like very interested in this. So shout out to you, you know who you are. I'm not sure if I can say your name on live, but I will ask who would be happy with an episode like that, like a little divergent episode on the winds. So let's do it. Let's, let's, we'll be back uh, in the future with a winds episode for you all on this divergent thing because we'll bring in more sources and more suppositions about the winds in a later episode and, and it, it is worth doing a full sort of look at so yeah here's us here's us promising a future episode <laughs> that's right okay um, okay so so then he moves on to the 12 parts lays that out um and then he gets into eight places i think matt did want to talk about this Let's try to do Matt some justice and pause on it, shall we? Yes. No, Matt wasn't able to stay. Matt was kind of like, oh, no, the eight places. I hate this because I don't totally love like I don't I don't think it's that Matt doesn't understand it because then when they went on to talk about it, they seemed to understand it just fine. But they were like, this is weird and confusing. So let's go ahead and talk about on the eight places. So essentially... The eight places um, <clears throat> start at our classical first place right. and move all the way around the wheel as we would just stopping at the eighth place. Yes. Indeed. And I think it's been speculated that in the past that there wouldn't have been blank houses on 9, 10, 11, and 12, and that there would have just been eight portions of the pie and that would have been total but here you know because we can't present today you have just the eight places right. um, from one to eight and it's part of where we get our classical uh, delineation of those houses so if you don't mind belaboring I'm just gonna say the first was the native or the life the second was hope or money mm -hmm. the third siblings the fourth parents the fifth, children, the sixth, illness, the seventh, spouse, and the eighth, death. And then the rest of the classical houses as we know them were blank. Yep. And I think, um, well, actually, the, 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 the interesting piece on that is that we have two house systems, right? There's the eight place house, and then there's a 12 place system. Um, Brennan talks about this in his book, Hellenistic Astrology. So shout out to Chris Brennan. Um, just, yeah, go ahead and check that out. Like it's a, yeah. there's a, any of these we could, cause these are fun to just let me, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but in the first part of this book, he's laying out fundamental concepts. So we could do like whole episodes on any of these, like 
you know, we could do an entire episode on the eight places, on the 12 places, and we're just trying to do a brief overview of what Firmicus lays out. Um, so lots of content here to go over in the future. But yeah, Brennan covers it. Um, does Dimitri cover it? Who else covers it? it? Yeah, I think Dimitri covers it too. Um, you know, it's 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 not uncovered. Um, but uh, the the part of the context is that, um, and this is actually probably a good point to, to mention this, which I think is very interesting, is that when we look at Hellenistic astrology or ancient astrology, um, we have a handful of books that we look from all written from different centuries, right? By different authors of different philosophical bents, perhaps participating in even different traditions. And, um, and then we look at that collectively and then we pick and choose between the different authors, like where the, where, where the, where, what, where, what, what's going to, in that, you know, we pick and choose like, oh, this is, so I don't be alarmed that he didn't mention the 12 place system, but I have a feeling the 12 place system's coming. Um, and I mean, the layout for the 12, how the 12, 12 houses basically comes next because Next, he starts talking about the different angles and the different, like, uh, succeedant and um, yep. cadent houses. So, but just before we move on to that, and yeah, this is covered and maybe we'll cover it more, but essentially he covers it here. Like, Maternus lays it out for us. But what he covers, and in a footnote, and I also thought this was cool, is um, he was saying, you know, you can just take if we're talking about the nativities of man here, we're also talking about the nativities of woman. So I thought that was actually kind of cool. Um, and Ben in the footnotes describes that he's a little bit surprised by that. And I think it's just awesome because it means he's thinking about women. <laughs> yep. He's he's thinking about doing natal charts for women. Yay. And then he just says that anything we could say about man, we could say about woman. Yay. Thanks for thinking about women. And then, um, he says, except uh, Venus shows the wife and Mars shows the husband. And we do see this in classical significations of look to Venus for the uh, feminine partner and look to Mars for the masculine dominant partner. Um, mm -hmm. And it's laid out right here. So I think it's good to note that it's laid out here in Firmicus. Um, yep. He knows his audience. <laughs> well, Let's hope. <laughs> I mean, he knows this one. Okay, so then we have the pivots of nativities. So this is where we have the rising, the midheaven, the setting, and the lower heaven. So the four uh, pivots, the, you know, hour marker, and the, I guess the kentron or the kendra, the um, yep. active places. And the idle places, the um, inactive places. In it's also this is this is the part here where he starts to lay out um, some of the realities of of the the chart system he was using at the time, um, and so you know if you follow Firmicus Paternus rigorously, it's clear he's using an equal house system, and he lays that out in his description of the pivots. Um, and there is an element. One of the issues that present he presents in the text is that he's pretty fixed on what those divisions look like, but then he's not quite sure how the midheaven can get to the 11th house. Right. So there's a bit of like, there's a, if you push hard enough in this area, you're going to see like a little bit of an issue, a problem, shall we say? Yep. Okay. So note that that's there. The house system problem never uh, evades us for long. Um so, yeah, then he talks about, yeah, the idol or cast down places that you already mentioned, which would be the, and then we've got the, the, you know, set, he calls them the secondary. So he says, he says the, we've got the pivots and then we've got the four secondary places, which is the good diamond, 11th, God, ninth, fifth, good fortune, third, the place of the goddess, the secondary places, he calls them. Yeah. And then. The idol or the cast down places. So the 12th bad diamond, 
uh, the declining or the post ascension, he doesn't actually give that one any kind of like special name, which is the eighth, then the bad fortune of the sixth and the infernal gate or the gate of Hades uh, uh, to the second house or the succeeding second. And he points out that the last ones of those, the bad of the bad places of the place of bad fortune and bad diamond, that's the the sixth and twelfth. They're the worst of the worst places. Yeah, he'll go on to yes, exactly. So he from here, then he actually goes on to say the ranking of all the places, and then he gives us what you'll know if you've studied, uh, you know, Hellenistic or traditional astrology, like the best of the pivots to the worst of the pivots, which I guess we could say. So we've got the best being well, and actually this is interesting because here he says. The first. We all know the first house is the best place. But then I was taught that the tenth was next in line. So yeah, so so this is an interesting thing. And in Dykes, uh, Ben Ben Dykes points this out. Um, and he talks about it's worth comparing. Um you know, I think in terms of the ranking of the places, I think uh I think Fetty's Valence does it. I know Dorotheus does it. And um, and so what you're gonna see is um there's different criteria for the ranking and so there'll be some variation. The first is always best. The 12th is always worse. Right. And, and, and then as you work, as you're working your way around, right. Um, you know, sometimes it's the seventh, there's an argument for that, but there's also the, the, the idea of the 10th being the second best. Right. Right. So here let's just say that he, you know, I learned it as it goes first, then 10th, then seventh, then fourth, right? Um, here he has it first being the best, then the seventh, then the tenth, then the fourth. Um, so it's interesting. So he, he categorizes it as anything on the horizon. So the horizontal, then the meridial. Yeah. You know, so that's interesting. Um, and then the secondary places. No, no, that's, he has a secondary. This is a kind of interesting to see how he's making them is whether they are configured to the ascendant and so so weirdly enough um the 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 part of it is is that uh the 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 places that aren't pivotal right aren't on on the pivots but configured to the ascendant are going to be um next in order right so you end up with uh the 11th the fifth the ninth and the third and a secondary good secondary, uh, secondary, secondary yeah and then and and it's it's an interesting piece because if you start comparing all those astrologers who rank the signs right and they rank the signs um the the third the third place is either the the least bad or the um the least good <laughs> right right and, and, then have, and then just after that we have the second which is like the best of the worst the best of the worst um and then and then the eighth uh and then we have uh and it's and it's like and then the the sixth and the twelfth kind of duke it out but the twelfth wins out as the worst of the worst places that's right that's right worst and, of the worst and even then it's like there's arguments to be made like is the 11th um you know it's like should it go first 12 11 yeah, that's, yeah, also, and you know what's interesting? I always thought about this when I know the 12th is the worst, and so I'm not pushing back against that because I may or may, not have, <laughs> I may or may not have experience with it. So, like, I'm not fighting that at all. But if you just use the logic of, like, what's just rising up over the ascendant and moving towards the 10th place or the 11th place, the best places, right? So you have the 12th in that sort of category, like just post ascension, like just rising to prominence or whatever. And I understand the 12th house because of its significations with birthing and pre-birth and like all of this stuff. It's like the portal of death. Got it. But after descending, after dying on the horizon, you go deeper into the descent towards the fourth. And to me, that is pretty ominous. Um, so yep. sometimes I'm like, that's really interesting that the 12th would still be the worst. And maybe the climb into life and prominence is actually more difficult and grueling than the sort of descent 
post death would be. So, you know, just something to think about. I'm going to reference people. You should check out Demetra's um, talk on the deacons. Yeah, uh, it's so good. There's, there's, there's a, there's a section there where she talks about the sort of interesting section of the twelfth place mm-hmm. that, um, that is like, is like that can be read as a way of, of finding certain kinds of prominence or or whatnot. Um, in, and it's a, it's, a, it, it points to that as you develop and deepen your skill in the astrology um, you begin to start to see and read more nuance into things. And so it's not just as simple as, um, you know, out of sect planet in 12 place bad. Um, it's not just as simple. Although as, it, can be. <laughs> it can be. I'm not saying, I'm not saying the loaded gun by the criminal in the next room uh, is, is a good thing. <laughs> right no no completely like i completely agree and that talk is like awesome and so i would point people to that but of course there's some nuance to the reading of the worst of the bad places and we're not just condemned to die for eternity if you have a planet there or something like that but it's just something i've thought about with that sort of like rising over the ascendant and falling below the horizon which is like that place of like uh invisibility or death so it's very interesting with the two worst of the worst um houses and also you see it with the decanic attributions of the tarot cards for anyone that watched the decanic series because you see gemini as the 12th house of the thema mundi and you see the gemini decanic cards is just being like tormented right like the one where you see the person lying down with all the swords in their back and things like that as a part of some of these gemini or 12th house thema mundi kind of vibes so okay all right enough 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 so then we have like the authority of the 12 places so he goes on to talk about some of the topics or the topical you know, authorities or significations, I guess you could call them, of the 12 places. Um, They're all the same as we just listed in the eighth, except for now we have the ninth, which is sex, sects, religions, travel, the 10th house, we have actions, arts, the arts, and the mind. The 11th house, we have three question marks. (laughs) And then the 12th house, we have enslaved people, um, enemies uh, and illness uh, and I guess the sixth house already had illness but here we see defects yep um, and it's they add a little bit to the fourth which is parents patrimony land or something that is hidden and they add to the third by offering friends and travel and siblings to the third house yep all right and- and and that honestly, the the what what he's added here, you know, it's kind of interesting. The the second goes from the gate of Hades to the um, hopes and assets. Isn't that quite interesting? Because you know what, it to me it parallels quite well. You know, right? <laughs> I actually think it parallels quite well, but we don't have to belabor it. He goes on and on. So like this is a big portion. Actually, he dedicates more to this area of talking about the significations here um, than any of the other chapters in this book. Um, It's three some pages. And then we go on to um, the stars that claim for themselves among the names of the 12 places, benevolent and malefic or malevolent stars. Um, So we're not going to get into all of that. He starts talking a little bit about the triangle, the hexagon, and giving some actual delineations uh, for misfortunes or um, luckiness. Whole adornment of luckiness will be wrapped up in in someone's miseries, he says. (laughs) Yeah, we were going to, we're going to pick up with the ranking of nativities next time. Yes. So if you are following along, but not in the study group, we've got you covered. All right. But, But, If you are so inspired, um, join the study group. You know, it's a, it's a, you buy the book, uh, you know, buy Ben's book. It's an excellent book. Super affordable. It's a really good book. Really affordable. It's actually one of the, one of the real blessings of what Ben Dykes produces in the world is 
he 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 has these really competent translations that are readily available and and actually affordable. Um, so and- affordable, like we're saying, like I'm not sure for international shipping and all of this, but we're talking twenty to thirty dollars. But and for books like in our field of study. That's ve- that's on the low side, and the quality of Ben's translations and the quality of his footnotes and the work that he puts into his translations, I feel is just impeccable. So it's like wild that he would be also on the low end of what you can get books for. So just thank you, Ben. You're a great yeah. resource. Um, so it's a very affordable book if you're inside the U.S., uh, if you have Prime free shipping, right? Um and also, to make it affordable to be in the study group, we've always had this option um, that you can join at the $5 tier. The group is really amazing. Being able to get everybody's ideas and questions rolling as you read through the text, make the text more enjoyable, more understandable. And we've got some real skill and expertise in the group. So if you'd like to join, um, there's multiple tier levels for you to join at. And the book is relatively inexpensive as well and really good. We've been having fun so far. Um, The link will be in the description below. Oh, you know what I forgot to cover at the beginning, which I am so sorry, Katie. Um, I now have some codes for you for the um, Schmidt website. So if you do want to study Schmidt, I have a coupon code for you and I will post that down below. So if you uh, were thinking about listening to any of the Schmidt talks or any of the Schmidt work, we have a special coupon code here for our channel, which I thought was really sweet of her um, to offer us. So I will post that down below as well. I guess that's a kind of closing announcement. Um, I should have hit that at the top, but you know, for those of you who already are subscribed to, you can um, resubscribe with this coupon code and get the code. I also have an affiliate link to where if you sign up under me, I think I get a little kickback, but also it shows how many people are sort of coming because of our work. So that's actually nice as well. So I'm going to post both of those below for you guys um, to sort of encourage that. Your lighting has become quite... Yeah, that's the sun The sun is out and the, the, I've, got a, I've got a curtain on one window and a not... I'm so- sure it's blinding and hot, but it actually gives quite the, like, amazing... Uh, it's shine off the forehead there. Yeah, it gives, like, kind of some dramatic, like... Very theater. noir. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope that we... You know, we're not really on a schedule for these for Mikis Maternus. I guess that's the last piece of closing news is that... Um, and by the way, if you're still here, drop emojis below. Drop likes. You've made it to the end of the video. Um, <clears throat> we are not going to be doing these like chapter by chapter. We meet once a month. We meet on the last Monday of every month. I think it's 7 p.m. East, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, yeah, 7 p.m. Central. Yep, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. on the West Sorry. Coast. Yep. So um, last Monday of every month. Now, we probably won't come to you every single month with overviews like we did today. We'll probably come once we've done a few uh, meetings. We'll get together and talk about what we've done so far. So thanks for following along if you're just following along here on YouTube. Um, Join us. It's fun. Uh, Firmicus, Firmicus has been kind of dry at this point, but he gets saucy. And (laughs) oh, I thought it's been good. Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh. Yeah, there's some trigger warnings in some of this. Uh... Yeah, there's some trigger warnings. Um, this is you definitely need to be over 13. Um, <laughs> well, today's 13 year olds. I don't know. I have a nephew. Who's <laughs> today's 13 year olds. <laughs> so. um, anyway, it's it gets saucy. It's been really fun so far. Um, and with that, I guess we'll close and we will see you with more episodes and see you next time. Thanks for the thousand subs. Celebrating that. See you all soon. Ciao. Mata iya mata o kaka Matsamba yu Namikai na soba Da soba
kena Mata ibang nakaw matima Na may kena soa And soa At iba na kena Ahucho na ba Ika na kamay Say no.